Hello and welcome to Unlit If I Want To. I'm Andrea Maury of Daria Renee Knits and I am back this week as I have been for the past 121 weeks trying my best to answer some of your making questions. We focus heavily on knitting in this little weekly podcast but I also like to dip my toes into spinning and sometimes we even chat about just life stuff, health stuff, sewing, uh, etc. So Let's jump into some questions. Before we do, today I am wearing my orchard dress. We are finally getting a rain-free day here. I'm very thrilled about it. I was chatting with someone yesterday and they said that we only had six days in June without rain, which is pretty bizarre weather for here, at least as long as we've lived here, which isn't super long, but we're going into our fifth year and never have we had just... A month and a half of continuous rain. Um, I was hoping that it was just going to be this June thing and then July we were going to get some drier weather so we could be outside a bit more but it is not really shaking out that way so far. We're supposed to have another nice day tomorrow but then the rain comes back Saturday for like seven or eight days so Woo, but it's nice to put on a dress. It is a little chilly in my studio, so I also threw on my attune shawl, which I've worn quite a bit recently. Um, this is my hand spun one. I used a marled cormo that I spun up for kind of this main color. You can barely even tell it's marled. It is a beige and a white, and so they're really close close in color. And then everything else was from Hedgehog Fibers, their fiber club. And there we go. I love it. I highly, highly recommend that if you are a spinner of yarn that you knit with your hand spun or weave with it, crochet with it, whatever you like to do. Because I just feel like I learned so much more about the yarn I make once I actually utilize it. And it's just, it's so fun. I feel like the more I look back at this shawl, and pull it out to wear it, the more tickled I am <laughs> with, with the results and how it turned out. So I just really love wrapping up in this little shawl. All right, of course we are doing the Attune Spin Along Knit Along. I've mentioned it for the last past couple weeks. You can find a link to all that info below as well as the info on this and the Orchard's dress. This is my hacked version of the Orchard's dress. You won't really be able to see much of it, but um, I added a number of inches to the bodice and then I turned the skirt of the dress into a three-tier uh, Instead of the original orchard's dress is just one long dress with one kind of ruffle on the bottom. So instead I turned it into three tiers and then I did this fun patchwork deal for, for it. <laughs> so, all right, let's get into some questions. I have lots of things to show you today, but quite a bit of it will just happen naturally as we're chatting. So let's jump in to this first question, which, oh my goodness, where has my brain been at the past few weeks? I cannot believe that I forgot to answer the last question last week. Um, also, thank you so much for every single one of you who left such a kind comment saying you were worried about me when my other video came out two days late. I just really appreciated that y'all were thinking about me. Um, and yep, nope, I just thought I had pushed a button that I hadn't pushed. So, yeah, that was just apparently I've got summer brain right now because then I completely forgot to answer that question. So we are starting with it right out the gate, question number one this week. So I'm really excited to knit the Traveler, but I did take the time to make myself a swatch. Yay! I've got perfect stitch gauge. However, my row gauge isn't quite there. 36 rows rather than 39 to get that four inches. I don't really want to mess with the needles when the stitch gauge is bang on. What do I do? I know that row gauge is particularly important with the stitch pattern, so should I be prioritizing that? So I would still go ahead and stick with your current needle size. I would definitely focus on that stitch gauge. At the end of the day, it's pretty challenging for us to hit both numbers of a gauge. It's really common to hit one and not the other because at the end of the day, we're all built a little differently. Our hands work differently. We might have a slightly different 
needle situation going on. I don't know why I'm picking up a spindle because that is not a knitting needle. Um, but <laughs> we just, we manipulate things, our hands differently, the yarn differently. So, so much goes into that, that makes that swatch vary. So go ahead and stick with your stitch gauge. Um, and I wish I, I wish I was wearing that sweater right now so I could kind of show it. But basically the Traveler's hoodie has vertical garter stripes is what it looks like. It's a few knit rows followed by a few purl rows to create this really fun texture. I love that texture so much. But because of that, the stockinette and then basically the reverse stockinette stripe is really what it is, is it creates this very flexible, um, almost like accordion like fabric, especially before it's blocked. And definitely depending on what yarn you're using, it's going to affect how much that stitch pattern grows. I am actually currently playing with that stitch pattern again, but I am using one yarn base. It's just a two ply lace weight. I think it's Gotland. And there's very little elasticity. That's the word I wanted to use in that fabric. It's very elastic. So there's very little elasticity in this yarn. And I'm holding it with a baby Surrey alpaca that has a core of silk. Also, basically no elasticity at all. So holding those two yarns together, what I'm noticing is that the fabric that it creates, even though I'm using a very similar stitch pattern, the drapes already there, even pre-blocking, it didn't grow nearly as much as when I was using the really bouncy wool yarns that I used for the Traveler. So I do talk about this a bit in the notes page in that pattern on page, it would be page three. Um, so using applied wool kind of bouncy yarn you can expect around approximately 15 percent of growth after you block it so i made a point to chat about it in the notes because i knew people were going to think it was too short but then they were going to block it and it was going to grow a lot and they were going to be like oh <laughs> um so i want to and i knew that people would sub in yarns and things like that so what is great is that you have done your swatch and I'm guessing you've blocked your swatch. So your discrepancy is about three rows per four inches short. And so your, your gauge is bigger on your rows than mine was. So I actually broke this down just so I didn't confuse myself as I was trying to not confuse you. <laughs> so if you were working at my gauge, and you wanted a depth of let's say eight inches. So I think that the yoke depth on the my size that I knit was around eight inches. So that would take me about 78 to 80 rows to get that. Um, especially so if the, I don't know why I'm saying about, we know that the gauge in that pattern, thank you for including it because I would have forgotten what it was by this point, is 39 stitches or 39 rows per four inches. So you would need about 78 rows to get to eight inches. Now at your gauge, you would only need 72 rows to hit that same length. So you would be looking at close to, actually, let's do that real quick. Let me pull that up so you can see exactly how much we're gonna be short. That's not what I wanna. Oh, I see. Sorry about this. Okay, so you're gonna be about a half inch difference. Not really the end of the world. So I don't know that I would worry too much about it, to be honest. I mean, when you think about the whole sweater, you're probably going to have an extra inch, inch and a half of length, I think, with your gauge discrepancy. What you could do is remove five or 10 rounds from the body of that sweatshirt. The thing about once you get to the yoke, so when we're working that stitch pattern in the round, it's a five round repeat. But once you get to working it flat, it turns into a 10 row repeat. So to remove or add any length in the yoke, you have to do it in 10 row increments. So you could knock out a whole inch from that yoke or sorry, I'm 
just defaulting to what I'm thinking of that gauge as. You could uh, take out a whole 10 row repeat, but for you, that's gonna be a little bit over an inch from the yoke. Now I'm confusing myself. I don't think I would worry about it too much. I think if you wanna remove a little bit of length, maybe consider doing it from the body. One thing to remember, and this took me a while, especially when I was first knitting sweaters, to really think about is the fact that when you are knitting, do I have any blank pages in here? This will do. It's my, my little kiddo's random drawing at the bottom here. Um, okay, so if you think about when you are knitting a sweater and you have, we'll kind of do the shape of the traveler. Wow, this is not a great sketch, but you're gonna, gonna get it. Okay, so you have your body length, right? And then you have your yoke length. And it's easy to think, oh, well, if I take any rounds out of here, will the body become too short? But don't forget that this sweater is hanging off of your shoulders here, and you're going to have this total length hanging down from your shoulders. So you can remove a little bit from the body and still not lose too much length overall from the sweater. So if you only wanted to remove about five rows, that's maybe where I would consider removing that. The only other thing you're going to want to take into account is how you feel about that sleeve circumference. If that sleeve circumference ended up being about an inch overall bigger than the size you're knitting and that would bother you, then I would go ahead and remove a 10 row repeat from the yoke. Also remember blocking is your friend. I found that there is some wiggle room with a sweater when blocking. If you, you know, take care to not stretch it out too much if you don't wanna to get too much extra length. Um, or if you did take that out, but you still wanted to kind of hit that perfect spot, you can stretch that a little bit um, to try and hit those measurements that you want. So I hope that all made sense. I know that was a lot of, a lot of chatting. Um, as I kind of worked it out in my own brain, but I don't think you're far enough off where it's going to overly impact your hoodie. You just need to decide what's important for you as far as if it was like maybe just a smidge longer than the schematic or a smidge shorter, how would you feel about that? And kind of decide based on that, do you want to just work it as is, have it be a little bit longer than the schematic says it's going to be or would you rather go ahead and remove some rows to make sure that you don't get any extra length also watch out on those sleeves because i find that um you might that's where you might want you know if you don't if you're particular about where your sleeve ends then you might want to remove a repeat or two from the sleeves like five to ten rounds um, so that those don't become just way too long. Whew, okay. You still with me? All right. I am currently knitting the throwback cardigan. Um, it's been great and currently up to the sleeves, which are always tedious because you have to do the whole turning of the whole garment as you do it. My question is, can you knit the sleeves first or separately with any sweater, jumper, cardigan design? Um, I made a cardigan from Tin Can Knits. It was so awesome to get the sleeves out of the way first. It also acts as a good swatch. Not sure if this can be done with any project. Um, so I'm gonna kind of work this one backwards. The only thing I would say about using your sleeves as a swatch is, are the sleeves knit flat? Is the body worked flat? Are the sleeves knit in the round? Is the body worked in the round? So if the sleeves are worked in the round, as is the body, I wouldn't necessarily trust them as a swatch for the body of that sweater because knitting small circumference, such as a sleeve, compared to large circumference, your body, there is a huge chance you're gonna have a discrepancy there. You're probably knitting tighter, small circumference sleeves than you will once you knit the body of that sweater, your gauge is gonna loosen up a little bit more than likely. So I just wanted to throw that out there about be careful. It's kind of like the whole hat swatch. I love the idea of using a hat as a swatch because how fun to actually have a wearable thing at the end of your swatching, because I know not all of us love to swatch, but it's just not the truest swatch, depending on what else you're going to knit. If it's gonna be a sweater, 
things might shift around a little bit. So I just always like to point that out because I have found that most knitters I come across do knit a bit tighter in a small circumference than they would in a large. So just keep that in mind. If the whole thing's gonna be flat and seamed, no issues there at all, go ahead and use that sleeve as your swatch. Um, if you are just a lucky ducky and you happen to have perfect tension, no matter if it's large or small circumference, then you do you and enjoy it. Um, as far as can you always knit the sleeves first? Not if those sleeves are picked up and knit out from the body, unless you want to seam them on, which you can. That's a modification you can make. Um, but then you'll have to do certain things. Like if it was a top-down round yoke sweater, such as the throwback. That's what you're knitting, right? Yeah, throwback. Um, so you put stitches on hold. If you wanted to knit those sleeves separately, you could either bind those stitches off instead of putting them on hold, knit your sleeve, and then just seam it. Or you could reverse engineer that sleeve, knit it from cuff up, and then graft using like, um, is it mattress stitch? No, not Kitchener. What is it? I'm just gonna go with graft. Just look up grafting your knitting. I'm sure there's a tutorial, but you would just graft your live stitches. Is it Kitchener? Maybe it is Kitchener. Anyways, you are, you could then graft those live stitches together from the top of the sleeve and then where you had put stitches on hold. So you wouldn't have bound them off in this scenario. Um, and you could graft all those live stitches together. The only thing I would take into consideration there is there is a chance that you might notice where you grafted them together. There might be a little bit of like a tensioning discrepancy there where you might kind of notice that line of where you sewed those sleeves together. Um, also consider that the underarm stitches hadn't been picked up yet. So you'll have to decide how, what you wanna do once you reach that patch of sleeve stitches that don't have any live stitches to be grafted to at the underarm yet. Um, so, one thing you can do that you could try that maybe you would like better is do the sleeves before the body. So do the yoke, maybe do an inch into the body, then put the body on hold, knit both your sleeves out from the sweater, then go back and finish the body. And you might find that a little less cumbersome. So that could be something you could try. Um, I do also know people who just really prefer knitting sleeves flat. They don't like knitting the sleeves in the round. So you could still pick up your stitches um, around the sleeve where it was put on hold and pick up those underarm stitches and then just cast on two extra stitches at that underarm to create a selvage. And then you could actually knit back and forth in rows depending on the stitch pattern and then seam it. And then I feel like you wouldn't be flopping so much because as that sleeve grows, it would be easier to twist back and forth like this. But that's actually what I do with my sweater when I am knitting a sleeve. Let me grab a sweater. Oh my goodness. Y'all are gonna laugh. I was saying how I wish I had the traveler to show you. <laughs> I had the crew neck one right there. Although it is in black, it's a little hard to see in this lighting. Um, I'm just gonna throw this off for a second. So what I would do if I had this on my needle and I was working in the round, I would knit, 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 rotate, knit, 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 and then rotate back, knit, knit, knit. And when you're kind of doing this movement instead of twirling where then you have to move the whole body of the sweater, you might find that a little less cumbersome. Also, I do find that once I'm like two to three inches into that sleeve, it gets so much easier to manage. I don't mind knitting sleeves at all, but the first couple inches are not my favorite because that is when it feels like the whole sweater has to kind of be moved like this. Um, but once they're a little longer, try not rotating the whole sweater and just kind of rotating back and forth and see if that's a little smoother for you. So I hope that helps. Um, so yeah, basically the question, the answer to that question, my long winded way of saying is there are patterns where you could do that if 
um, like a bottom up raglan or a bottom up round yoke sweater. Those would both be great examples of when you could start with the sleeves because the sleeves are put on hold anyways or joined to the yoke. Um, that's already the nature of the pattern. But knitting top down where you're supposed to pick up stitches and knit straight down from something, that's when it would get a little trickier to do. All right, next question. I just tried habit stacking. So for those of you who don't subscribe to my newsletter, I was talking about habit stacking uh, two weeks ago and just talking about how I love to take my knitting and go for a walk around the bay where I live. And for a while, I just felt like I couldn't fit in my walks and I was really missing them. So that's what really got me back into the habit of walking and knitting. I always love to walk and knit, but I had kind of fallen out of the habit. I felt like I had too much work and I couldn't take the time. And I was like, okay, we got to just get some knitting on the needle so I can walk around with. So I, in my newsletter, was sharing about that. Um, so they continue to say, um, it's taken a little while still, but I finally headed out with my needles and walked along the beach. I love being out in nature and know it's so good for our mental well-being, but it's still hard work some days. I was wondering if you would be creating a hashtag or group that we could share our walking knit-alongs. I thought this was the sweetest idea to come up with a little hashtag where we could share. Maybe I could even start a little forum in my Ravelry group if y'all wanted to chat, if you have a project you're using or a favorite bag you found works really well for your walking knits. Um, I just thought it would be a really fun way to connect. So how about we do a little hashtag contest? So I am going to start a Ravelry forum in my, in the Drea Renee Knits Ravelry group. And if y'all want, you can go there and you could submit a hashtag idea. And whichever one I choose, I'll give you a free pattern of your choice. You can tell me which pattern you want. Um, just to clarify, because I don't trust ever talking about any kind of giveaway or anything like that on the social medias because weird bots and fake accounts come in and say people have won things. We do try to filter through all comments now so that we can get those out of here because we were having an issue with it for a little while, even when I wasn't talking about people winning anything. Um, but just FYI, I will never ask for any of your personal information when you win a giveaway, especially not things like credit card numbers and whatnot. Um, so this will be, I will contact you uh, through Ravelry um, if your submission wins, but you can just go there and I'll put a link down below if you have a hashtag idea and whichever one wins, I'll give you a pattern. So I will put that link below. I'm going to make that right after I finish this video. And let's keep chatting about this. The next question is, hopefully I didn't miss this, but I'm so curious about how you carry your yarn for your walk-in knits. So I have shown some of these before, but it does come up all the time. It is one of the main questions I get whenever I talk about walking and knitting is everyone's like, but what do you use? Like what bag do you carry? So I brought two of my favorites that I really like. So a couple tips for walking and knitting. I do recommend simple projects like stockinette stitch, garter stitch, something that really doesn't take much brain focus that your hands already have memorized. Um, whatever you find really rhythmic and don't need to look down at a lot. I also do prefer smaller projects. I usually do socks or a hat or a cowl, something like that. I will also do the hem of a sweater or the beginning of a sweater before it's too cumbersome because that's still lightweight. The only thing I would be careful of is if it is a bigger project, like a big shawl or sweater, is once that project's a certain size, you don't want gravity to start pulling on those stitches too much while you walk. You might see some weird tensioning issues. So I always like to just give that little tip. Um, so because I prefer those smaller projects, I use these smaller bags. So this one is a main company, Matterroot Main. And I love this. It can clip right on. I just put it right on my wrist and then I feed my knitting out of there. It's perfect for like a single cake of yarn, even two if I'm doing 
like two color brioche like my current project um and then i just slip it on my wrist and that works really well and now i'm getting more i'm gonna take my shawl off um otherwise i love this little bag this is from buku and it is just a little canvas bag one thing i extra love about this one is there's a pocket inside so i like to slip my headphones or my phone or my row counter or my measuring tape into that little pocket and then this is nice it's just a you know a long crossbody strap and so i'll walk with that and that works really well and feeds out the top if i don't want something hanging on my wrist but either of those works great so those are the two that i definitely recommend that i like walking with a lot i'm gonna write those here so I don't forget links. I did just see that Buku is about to sew up some more of those. I have one other ones of that that is their patchwork and it's so pretty. So um, I believe they're working on some of those right now. And Matter Root Main, and they do all kinds of fun. One of my favorite ones, so I have this pink one with these cute little knit stitches and then I have another one that has honeycomb. And it's like a mustard yellow with a tweedy fabric. It's so pretty. So those are just fun. Sometimes the Matter Root Main you can find at festivals, um, like yarn festivals. I have been able to snag a bag or two at some of those. So keep an eye out for that too. But I'll link to both their sites below. All right, let's talk about socks. <clears throat> when knitting socks, do you recommend negative ease for both length and width? How much? I remember reading somewhere that someone suggested only negative ease for length, while another website said both length and width. I'd made myself a pair of socks that ended up fitting way too much like a glove, and they may be perfect for wearing in shoes, but they don't feel nice and cozy for wearing around the house. So I feel ya. This is where I would actually kind of consider my little magic numbers concept because I can give you an, an ideal range. I can say, you know, I do like it in both length and width, usually half an inch to one inch, one centimeter to two and a half centimeters of negative ease. Um, because, and I'm going to jump back to my previous thought, but the one thing you do want to think about, you mentioned they're great in shoes, not so great for wearing around the house. You might want to decide when you are knitting a pair of socks, do I think I'm going to be wearing these with my shoes or do I think I'm going to be wearing these around my house? And then you'll want to think about those magic numbers. So find your sweet spot. I would consider the socks that feel like a glove, maybe they had an inch of negative ease both ways. And that was just a little too much. So maybe for your shoes, you want closer between half an inch and three quarters of an inch of negative ease. But maybe around the house, you want zero ease or you only want a little negative ease in the length so that they don't stretch out and get floppy. Um, so just make notes of that. Like, don't forget that even though there are recommendations, they're still your personal preference. The one thing I would consider is your socks will generally wear out faster the more they move around in your shoe. So the closer they fit to your foot when you are wearing them with shoes, the more slowly they'll break down and get holes. So you, you that's why I say you might want to decide ahead of time, like these are going to be my sock shoes, these are going to be my, or my sock, my shoe socks and my house socks so that you can decide for comfort. Because I also feel you, if I have a sock that's like a little bit too tight when I'm pulling it on, I get the same way where I'm like, mm, this doesn't feel the cozy I want it to feel. But I also have other ones where like I pull on my boots and I can feel that heel shift up. And I know I'm gonna get a hole in those because they're, they're obviously moving around too much and are a little too big. So try and find your perfect spot. And that might just be a little bit of trial and error. You might need to knit a couple socks to see what is your best fit. But once you found it, make sure you write those down in your knitting journal. And in the meantime, when they turn out maybe a little on the tight side, those are going to be your shoe socks. <laughs> and when they're a little on the loose side, those ones you can wear around your house as you kind of figure out those perfect numbers for you. Um, also, it is going to depend a little bit on the patterning that might be on those socks if you are doing any kind of stitch pattern. So keep that in mind too. You might find your perfect fit 
but that might still be tweaked a little bit depending on what patterning those socks have and if your sock yarn is very elastic or not, things like that. All right, last question. Oh, this is another fun one and has to do with bags again. Um, okay, I am getting a blah, 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 blah. I am getting ready for a trip to Europe and I could use your advice as to how to pack my knitting. I've already listened to your advice regarding needles, but I am interested to see what bag you use and how you pack. I will tra travel with ca in cabin luggage only, um, so just carry on. Thank you. So I will be the first to admit that I am not a carry on traveler. <laughs> I generally am teaching when I travel, and so I travel with a big old suitcase that has to be checked. I admire all of you who can travel with just a carry on. Um, that has not been my experience, but I will still show you what I use around the airport and everything like that. So I pretty much always travel with this backpack. I also have another one that is similar to it. This one I got to make. So I took a class last year and I got to make this backpack, including I wove these panels and then we got to punch the holes in the leather and punch out the like shape the little leather and then we got to use these industrial sewing machines to actually sew it all together it was amazing it was a class by amber jensen i don't know if she'll ever teach it again but she does do some other weaving classes and you can sometimes order bags from her and she is a phenomenal weaver so i will also mention her just in case any of y'all want to be able to find her very inspirational artist. Okay, so this is the backpack I carry. And I like this one because it has a spot for my water bottle and a spot for my mug. I always carry a travel mug for my tea or my coffee. And I also like that it has front pocket. It also has interior pocket. So this tends to be mostly, again, when you have your own business, you don't really get a whole lot of time off. And so I'm always traveling with a computer and things like that. So I usually put my computer in that inner sleeve and um, snacks and things like that. But then also a lot of times my knitting needle case, maybe an extra project will all go in here. But to maximize my space, because on a flight you can usually have one carry-on and one personal item, I kind of stretch that personal item by using a bag that I can clip onto my backpack. So a lot of times I'll put my current knitting project. I also want easy access because depending on what you're carrying it and where it's going to have to be stored, I like to easily take my little knitting bag off so I can tuck it next to me in my seat and knit the whole time. So again, that one I just showed, I love to clip those onto my luggage. Um, if I do have a rolly bag, I clip it right onto the handle or I clip it onto my backpack. I also love, this is the Hide and Hammer roll top bag. This is one that has traveled with me a ton. And you could clip it either by the top here, but this handle also unclips. And so I will wrap the handle through one of my backpack straps and just let it hang off. And as you can see, I can fit a bigger project in here. So if my plain project is maybe a sweater or a big shawl or color work, something that has multiple cakes, this is the one I carry. Um, so that is, that's how I travel. Hide and hammer. That is how I travel with my knitting um, on the plane and everything. All right. How about some show and tell before we wrap things up here? As many of you know, it has been Tour de Fleece the past, what is today? A few days, <laughs> almost a week, not quite a week. Um, coming up on a week, week tomorrow. So I have been spindle spinning and also processing some fleece. So I have been trying to, actually, you know what? I'm probably gonna wanna share with y'all one more thing. Um, I mentioned here a while ago that Tazi from Tangles and Starlight, I hope I'm saying that right. I always mix up her Instagram and YouTube every single time. So, but I think it's Tangled and Starlight, that might be it. Anyways, I will absolutely tag them below. 
was so amazing and gifted me some samples of some of her fleeces and I finally processed them. It was a roller coaster of a ride. There were times where I was like, I don't have time for this. What am I thinking? I have such limited spinning time. I should just buy ready to spin fiber. And then I would get through a step and be like, oh my gosh, but look at this. Wow. And then I would get to the next step and be like, oh, I'm doing this all wrong. I'm not good at this. Oh, this is just not something I would be into. And then I would push through and keep going and be like, oh, I do love this. I mean, it was like a melodrama playing out in my head the whole time that I was doing it. Um, but I'm so happy that I stuck with it and that I made myself slow down and do it. I think a lot of us can relate that in this day and age, we tend to go at a breakneck speed. It's hard to slow down. It's hard to find that balance. Sometimes it's hard to justify making space for the things that bring us joy. And so as I was spinning yesterday, I was actually thinking about how amazing it is to have these practices, these things that we make, because there's no turning back. We live in a society that is jam-packed, full of distractions and screens and social media and all these things, which absolutely, I mean, I wouldn't have ever found Tazi or many other makers if things like YouTube and Instagram and these things didn't exist to help connect us all. And so in my life, I'm just trying to find that balance. I want to find ways to stay grounded because I think it's really easy to all of a sudden just never be setting that phone down or, you know, all these things. It's like, let's use them for the beautiful things they can give us, the amazing connections and the things we can learn. I mean, it's amazing the resources we have. But at the same time, how do I stay grounded and not letting my time be robbed away from me? And making is one of the ways I do that, especially spinning, because to be honest, you can't pick up a phone easily when you are spinning. Your hands are pretty darn busy. So anyways, side tangent there. But I pushed through and it was really fun. It was really fun. Even the hard parts, I'm just so happy. What I did found that I would recommend if you are learning anything new is when you start to feel a little defeated or frustrated, allow yourself a break. Because what I found is I would just need to set everything aside for a minute. And because I think that learning anything can come with fear and vulnerability, right? And so when I would set it aside, I would then do something that did like fill me up that I could just do joyfully without those concerns getting in the way. So whether it was a little bit of spinning or knitting, whatever it may be. And then what I would notice is within a couple hours or maybe the next day, my curiosity would start to crawl back in. And I'd be like, oh man, okay, I can't, I do, I want to see what if I did this? Maybe this would have a better outcome. Because where I got a little caught up, so the washing of the fleece didn't end up being as hard or scary or tedious as I thought it was going to be. That was the part that I was kind of like not jumping into right away because I just didn't really know what I was doing and I knew I didn't want to be super fiddly with it. There are some amazing fiber artists out there who do everything by these mathematical proportions and I just kind of <laughs> estimated but it was fine and it worked out great. I ended up washing everything. I think it was, I think I did three washes with the unicorn power scour stuff that I got from Port Fiber and I just diluted it more each time and then I did a final rinse and I think it worked out really well. I actually, all this to say, no, let's not jump ahead. I'm going to finish my little story here, um, but I will try to not be long-winded about it. So the way I went about it is I scoured all the fleeces, two of them, I actually went through, I organized the locks in these little pretty stacks, got out the second cuts and the VM as much as I could. The other two, I was just like, you know what? I'm never gonna do this unless I do it today. So the other two just went straight from the bags they were given in into my little laundry bags. I put everything in like lingerie laundry bags to do the soak so that everything wouldn't drift apart. And they just went in there. Um, from there, I let them dry. And my whole plan was to use my drum carter to process all of them. 
I have only tried hand carters once and I've never tried combs, but the hand carters immediately triggered my carpal tunnel from when I used to be a baker, like immediately. I was really surprised that within a couple minutes, my wrists just were not happy. So I don't know that I'll ever be the person who processes fiber on hand cards or with hand combs. Who knows? I feel like every time I say I won't do something, I end up being like, well, maybe I'll try it. <laughs> but for this, I just use my drum carter. And I will say uh, the easiest one to get on my drum carter and that made like the nicest, cleanest bat was the Coriadale that I had gone through and laid out all the locks. Um, it's also a longer staple length and they were all just, they, it's like they wanted to be these tidy little soldiers. Where, to, so I did Romney, Coriadale and two Shetland, all of which were from Lambs. And both the Shetlands were quite short fibers. And those ones were the hardest for me. And the ones that I was like, oh my gosh, I feel like I've just ruined this on my drum carter. It's a hot mess. But what I ended up finding was I just needed to put it through a few more times. And I did do some fun mix-ins with each because why not? So all that to say, I am currently spinning one of them right now. So this is a little bit of that bat. And this one is both Shetland and Coriadale. And in there, I mixed um, a little dyed Coriadale and some Sorry Silk. And okay. here's my first little bobbin. I am spinning this long draw, so it's a woolen spin. It's pretty messy, but it's going to be a three ply, and I'm really excited to see that final yarn. This is my smallest bat of the ones I made. This is primarily the Coriadale with just a touch of that Shetland. Basically what I ended up doing was I wanted, I was afraid of being able to get an enjoyable bat to spin with the Shetland all by itself because they were so jumbled and there was there were some second cuts and things in there that had I gone through and sorted it probably would have worked out better but um so I was like you know what I'm gonna blend them together to make it more usable for me um so this is this is my other one again just some sorry silk thrown in there and then I have and then these are the Romney oh one's Romney one's Shetland so this one's just Romney with just some fun mix-ins. I had some little tiny nestlets from Nest Fiber that I threw in here and some Sari Silk. I'm really excited to spin this one up and it is so soft. I will say I was so worried after this one came out of the bath, I was like, oh, maybe I need to wash this one more because the tips still looked a bit discolored and stuck together. And I just tried teasing them out and then they were beautiful and it worked great. So they didn't actually end up needing the another wash. Um, so just, just to share. And then actually this one is just the Shetland, but I mixed it. So this is also my way of like using up those little things you got, you have just lying around. So I had ordered from School of Sweet Georgia, you can order these little bitty, I don't even, maybe they're a half ounce. I don't know. I will say I wasn't like super careful in measuring out all my bits and bobs for these, but um, there were these little tiny bags of different fibers to try and I had like four of them and I knew that those were combed and orderly and I knew they would make it easier for me again to spin that Shetland that was so short and kind of jumbled. And so I made this bat with all those. Again, this just has sorry, um, recycled sorry silk mixed in. So it was kind of the bat if you want to see it opened up a little bit. So anyways, I am so tickled. And at the end of the day, through all the ups and downs, I could actually see maybe snagging a fleece at Rimbic this year. We'll see. Only time will tell. I also want to do a big stash down though. I'm like, I've got to spin the fiber I have because it is collecting and... I don't know about you, but when I have too much, it stresses me out. I'm like, I got to use this. So I'm like, okay, we have to see how far I can get in my fiber stash before Rhinebeck. We will see. All right. 
Last little bit. I know this is a lot of spinning chat, um, but I also appreciated all of you non-spinners who commented on my last video saying that you still enjoyed the spinning chat. So thanks for that. Um, I know sometimes when it's about a craft that you don't partake in, it's not always as interesting. So I appreciate you sticking around for it. All right, the last thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to show you my current Tour de Fleece spins, and it's pretty quick. So I also wanted to show you these fun little spindles I'm using. So I am focusing on spindle spins for Tour de Fleece. Basically, my goal was to throw myself into things I wasn't very comfortable with, hence the fleece processing, <laughs> and uh, spindle spinning. So as you know, if you've been hanging around here, I recently learned because I'm going to be traveling a little bit during some of the tour and I didn't want to miss out on spinning. So I am focusing on that. And I joined the Spun Right Round, did kind of like a little advent style calendar where you have a bump of fiber to open every day of the tour. So I'm just spinning one of those a day. And to be honest on a spindle, it's pretty much all I can do in a day. I run out of time. to. I thought I was going to have like a side project on my wheel, spinning another sweaters quantity, all this stuff. And I'm like, nope, apparently I'm just doing this. Um, so the first thing I wanted to show, because I know that a lot of people were curious when I posted these on Instagram, is these little um it's funny because i have the wrong this isn't the rod that goes with this one but um i'll just show you like this so these fun little bobbin spindles for so these are from carrie cherry and they're literally bobbins that you can remove from the shaft and then you just plop a new one on so for us wheel spinners who are used to working with bobbins this was amazing for me because that's been my one kind of hiccup is I'm like, I don't know how to get this fiber off of these spindles. So I've tried putting my Bosworth spindles onto my Lazy Kate from, that go with my matchless wheel. So it's my shocked Lazy Kate. And I kind of got it to balance, but it would just keep dropping out of one end and it was so annoying. Um, so I'm still trying to figure out the perfect solution. I think today I'm actually, I did find a little bin that I had knocking around my studio that I'm going to drill some holes in and see if I can get that to work. Otherwise, I did think about, this is my Lazy Kate that came with my Hanson e-spinner. And it just goes like that. There's three of them. And I'm almost wondering if I can balance, if those are close to the same circumference, I'm wondering if I can push my cop down from my spindle right onto the shaft of my Lazy Kate. So I might try that, but I'm a little nervous. So we'll see. Uh, otherwise, I'm just going to do a whole bunch of center ply balls. Okay, so here is day one. Day two, day three, oops, day three must have been a larger bit of fiber because I ended up having to wind a cop below the bobbin. Kind of defeats the purpose of these removable bobbins because now it's stuck on here with the cop. So I'm going to have to wind this on. I thought about just putting it onto an empty bobbin. I have some storage bobbins uh, from my wheels that I thought about winding this on to. Uh, so those were the first three days. And then I, this is my first Turkish spindle adventure. If I hide my face, I feel like it shows y'all better. Um, which I will say, I enjoyed this more than I thought I would. It was so fun to wind that little turtle. And then I did have somebody ask, well, how, what do you, how do you get the turtle off? So you actually just slide this out and then both of these slide out as well. And you're just left with a little center pole ball, which is very cool especially while traveling. All right, so that was days one, one, two, three, four. Here's day five. And day six. So this will actually, this video will go live on day seven. So I don't have anything for that yet. Um, but there's my next little Turkish spindle that I'm doing. So there we go. So that is my spindle spin. That is my tour thus far. And woo, this is a long one. My goodness, we're creeping up on an hour. So if you got to stick with me this whole time, thank you so much. I will end it here because I've just been a very chatty Kathy. Um, but I hope that y'all have a great weekend. 
and I hope to see you back here next week. I will be wearing a brand new pattern that I cannot wait to show you. So if you are not already, make sure to subscribe to my newsletter so that you can get the exclusive subscriber discount on not one, but two new patterns that are coming out next week. I of course will put a link to that in the description below as well. And I hope you have a lovely weekend. I hope you get to make something and I'll see you back here soon. Bye.